Good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System and Executive Vice Chancellor for the University of Kansas Medical Center. Welcome back to Open Mics with Dr. Stites and my favorite program, Show Me the Science. Today, we're learning about a family of bacteria called mycobacteria, not micro, meaning small, but myco, M-Y-C-O. They're everywhere, soil, dust, water, tap water. Step in a water pool and scatter the water, you're scattering the mycobacteria, but don't be scared because they're typically not harmful. However, in some cases, these germs can cause serious and even deadly infections. This family of bacteria has a lot of members. When you go to a family reunion for mycobacteria, there's over 190 different species. Yes, that sounds like a, re a reunion of Star Trek. But we divide the family into two groups, as Shakespeare once wrote, to be or not to be. Oh man, I, I gotta do better on some of these comments I'm making today. That is to say, Mycobacteria tuberculosis as one group, and then the rest of the family called brilliantly the non-tuberculous Mycobacteria, or NTM. So you're, you're either with the in crowd or you're within the not the in crowd, the nons. You've heard of tuberculosis, I'm sure. Today we're talking about both TB and NTM, the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. But before we launch into our discussion, it's Red Wednesday, and we are talking with Dr. Ragu Adiga, the CEO of the Liberty Market for the University of Kansas Health System. The health system has been celebrating the Chiefs for years, and we're glad that our friends in the Northland are getting to join into the fun. Okay, Dr. Adiga. Tell us what you've seen and done so far this morning, but first, can I just comment? Red Chiefs tie, hold your wrists up, let's see the cuffs, come on. Show me the cuffs, baby, and what a backdrop. You've really got it going on this morning now. That's awesome. What have you been doing up there? Uh, it's been a fun morning here. Uh, we had the Casey Wolf here, we had cheerleaders, we had the drumline. Staff had a wonderful time this morning. This, was, uh, this has been great. Awesome, as it should be for we're, the big uh, win tomorrow we're night. Really we're looking forward to the game tomorrow. Journey. Yeah, uh, for the three P, man, we're going. So now, did you purchase your flag? Yeah, I purchased yeah. my cheese flag on the way in this morning. I should have brought it down here. My fail, but I have a flag. Yep, I I got mine. Awesome. So, um, yep, it, what's your prediction yep. about uh, for the Chiefs' upcoming season, my friend? Well, of course, they're going to go for the three-peat and they're going to get it. And, you know, first time in the NFL history. Can't wait. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really excited for the Chiefs and uh, the whole Kansas City. And uh, we're all huge fans here. So, um, you know, do you, you know, think just, the, just like our, our hospital. Absolutely. Do you think the excitement surrounding the Chiefs new season translated to the staff? Is this kind of a little celebration, a bit of a morale booster? Definitely. I mean, I think uh, there is a lot of commonality between Chiefs and uh, um, us, our staff here and in the system as well. You know, we come here and uh, we've got a goal and we work hard on it and we have fun. I mean, uh, you've seen the Chiefs. I mean, they have lots of fun at work. And I think that's the beauty of it. Come to work and also have fun while doing good, good things. So uh, we're, we're all excited here. So it's a good thing I don't have to do this program Friday morning because Thursday night I'll probably be screaming off my head at Arrowhead Stadium where it will be considerably nicer than the last time I made an appearance at Arrowhead Stadium, not that the Chiefs care, but it was minus 20 degrees and this time it's going to be like 70 degrees. I can't imagine a more perfect weather for the football game. So Dr. Adiga, thank you. Yeah, no it's, Chiefs, it's going to be good. You're an infectious disease doctor. Thank you. You helped lead our community yes. during COVID. And now we're about to talk about mycobacteria. You know, you're welcome to stay there, brother. Oh, oh, thank you, Steve. I know, I know, I don't want to say no on national TV to you, but on the other hand, you've got such great experts there. You don't need me, and uh, I, I, won't, I won't be able to stand any ground. If you ask me what's NTM today, it's nationally televised matchup against Ravens. That's all I can talk about. So oh, I'll let, you, let you go on right, with right, the discussion right. of NTM. You know, <laughs> KC Mo. Let's go, KC Mo. All right. Thank uh, you, sir. Uh, I'm not going to sing for you, but go Chiefs. <laughs> go Chiefs. All right, man. Helping me uh, teach about mycobacteria in the studio are two top-notch uh, uh, two top infectious disease doctors. 
Dr. Matt Shoemaker, the Infectious uh, the Disease Division Director here at the University of Kansas Health System, and our very own Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Doc Hawk, the Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. There is also a world-renowned expert in non-tuberculous mycobacterium, especially in lung infections, Dr. Andrea Schmid, a pulmonologist here at the health system, one of my colleagues in the Division of Pulmonary Medicine. All right, we're gonna start with mycobacterium tuberculosis. Before COVID, TB was the deadliest infectious disease in the world. This is not an uncommon disease, folks, and it's still the second deadliest. For the World Health Organization, about 10 million people get sick with TB and 1.5 million people die from it. Is that yearly, Dr. Shoemaker? Uh, yeah, that's every, every year. That's um, amazing. And so we, we know tuberculosis, or just called TB, is a public health concern. The Kansas Department of Health and Environment recently confirmed nearly 50 cases of TB in Wyandotte and 75 cases statewide. Talk to us a little bit about what is TB really, how easily is it spread, and why is it here in Kansas? So TB is a, is a bacteria that's spread through cough. Uh, and other, like COVID. Like COVID, yeah, it's, it's spread through airborne. So coughing, speaking, singing, um, it is not as contagious as say COVID. Um, so you have to be in contact for, for a little prolonged time, uh, particularly indoors. Uh, and those who are very young, very old, or have a suppressed immune system are at increased risk for getting the infection and acquiring it. And isn't it really, especially if you come into a place where folks are together for a long period of time with an inside environment without a lot of air movement, that's like if somebody's got TB, you can spread it in that environment. Oh, absolutely. Like uh, the best example is a household, you know, where we see outbreaks where if a family member has it, uh, it will go through the other family members as well. Or congregate settings, you know, churches, uh, prisons, college dormitories, military barracks. And as I recall, I mean, this is not just a Kansas or Missouri thing. This is a national and worldwide thing, as we talked about. Tell me why is TB so prevalent across the entire globe? So a lot of it has to do with, with countries that don't have the medical infrastructure of the United States uh, and people don't have the access to care. Uh, another big driver of TB worldwide is, is untreated HIV. So people with HIV, particularly those with AIDS who have a really suppressed immune system are at higher risk, but anybody living with HIV. So uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of uh, the Asian continent, it's very common. Yeah, now symptoms um, of being infected with tuberculosis include coughing, sometimes fevers and chills, but usually coughing, often with mucus that's bloody, weight loss, fatigue, weakness, night sweats are really common, the night sweat comment, and then just not feeling well, kind of this lassitude and things. Talk to us a little bit. Um, you can also have tuberculosis without symptoms though, something called latent TB. So latent TB infection is after you've been exposed and you've inhaled the, the bacteria into your lungs, your immune system is able to control them and kind of keep them in check. Now in places where there's not a lot of TB prevalence, so it's unlikely to acquire, we would recommend treating those people in the event that they would reactivate. So if they got uh, chemotherapy or prednisone, or if they were a diabetic or an alcoholic or they had HIV, they would be at increased risk for reactivating that disease. Any kind then, of chronic disease. Any, really. yeah, and becoming contagious. Now when you have the latent tuberculosis infection, you're not contagious. Okay. Now, Doc Hawk, explain what's happening when TB is considered latent. Mm -hmm. Explain the risk of it becoming active again and thoughts you might have about this whole TB deal. Yeah, no, I think this is a great topic. So again, we're talking about mycobacterium and people think fungus. It's not actually a fungus as you already talked about. We should let people know that when it was discovered in 1896, it was called mycobacteria. They thought it was a fungus because of just the way it looked and the way it grew in uh, the culture medium. We have an image of that too, and you can see those kind of just fungating areas. So that is why it was based on the gross description of what they, they saw. But we should let people understand that it is a bacteria. And so from there we go to, is it infection or disease? And certainly with COVID, we taught people about infection with the virus versus actual disease that it caused. The same thing is happening here. So we have 
tuberculosis infection, which historically has been called latent TB, which means your body has been exposed to it or your body is controlling it. Just as Dr. Shoemaker said, we have our innate immune system and also our adaptive immune system. And those mechanisms really help keep it controlled, whether it's in our lungs, and uh, Dr. Shoemaker also mentioned about other places that it can be in our body or other places in our body as well. Now, when our immune system doesn't work as well because we're immunosuppressed or just like you heard Dr. Shoemaker talk about with other risk factors, when it is not working as well, those bacteria can evade that immune system, overcome that immune system and cause TB disease or tuberculosis disease, and that is when you start to have illness, you start to have those symptoms. There is treatment for tuberculosis infection, and when people take that, they can significantly, up to 90%, reduce the chance that later on they can develop TB disease. Why is that important? Because there are people out there walking around that we don't even know about that are immunosuppressed for one reason or another. Maybe they, maybe they have cancer, maybe they have HIV AIDS, maybe they're on immunosuppressive drugs for something like a rheumatologic issue. Uh, but there are a lot more uh, immunosuppressive drugs out there that people are on to help contain and control other illnesses that they have. When people are immune suppressed, that disease, TB, can then proliferate and cause disease. And this can happen five years down the road. 10 years down the road, even a couple decades down the road, as, as you all well know and can talk about that as well. So we do have treatment for tuberculosis infection, but also, unfortunately, what we're dealing with now is also tuberculosis disease. There is treatment for that, uh, but that depends on the bacteria itself. Are you resistant? Are you multi-drug resistant? And treatment for that usually does take a more complicated course, dealing with multiple medications for a long period of time. So we're going to move into this treatment part of tuberculosis now, and we know that we have to treat that um, because it can be a public health hazard, and it can be deadly if it goes, it is deadly if oftentimes if you, if you don't get therapy for it. So Dr. Shoemaker, Dr. Hawk mentioned some of that. Talk to us a little bit about the combination of antibiotics. I know you've been doing work with KDHE, et cetera, to help address cases um, throughout the state that, that might arise. So we use uh, kind of the same medications whether we're talking about the latent infection versus disease. Uh, for the latent infection, we would use a medicine called isoniazide, which has been around since uh, the 1950s, as well as something like rifampin, which falls into a group of the, the rifamycins. And those treatment courses can be anywhere. There's a treatment course that's three months, four months, and then nine months. Uh, and that's the one that reduces your risk of developing disease. Now for disease, we always start out with four drugs. Uh, rifampin and isoniazide being in there, but then we also use ethambutol and pyrazinamide. And you'll use four drugs for two months and then two drugs for an additional four months for a total of six months, in most cases of pulmonary disease. Now, TB is like my favorite bacteria, syphilis. It's a great masquerader, right? Mm -hmm. It can do anything. So though, although it's most commonly in the you lungs. Did you syphilis your favorite bacteria? <laughs> I did. I think you did. I did. That's disturbing at some level. I don't <laughs> know which exactly it is. Go ahead. Um, it can it's go like that anywhere. Bow tie and those stripes. That's all I'm I saying. <laughs> yeah, my wife. Me. She let me out of the house without I, looking at me. Yeah, yeah uh, evidently. Um, but it can cause any kind of disease anywhere. It can go. It can cause meningitis. It can cause urinary tract infections. It can uh, infect any place in your body, your spine, your bones. So, um, and in those cases, the treatments would be longer, up to 12, 18, sometimes 24 months, depending on on the severity of disease and. And if I remember, part of the reason you treat so long is that most bacteria work, sorry, most antibiotics work against bacteria when they reproduce. <clears throat> TB reproduces slowly. And so you have to take a long time to make sure you get to all the different bacteria. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a good point with, say, let's say staph. If we put staph in the lab, uh, we can grow it within 24, 48 hours. TB takes four to six weeks to grow. So because it grows so slowly, and the antibiotics only work when the bacteria are reproducing and growing, we have to treat it for longer. I think we used to call that the G-not period of the cell cycle. How about pulling that one out of the hat for an old guy like me? Not bad. What are you shaking your head for? That was pretty good. I know, but that brings back trauma and all that kind of stuff <laughs> from early in, early in, in the lessons. Okay, so Hawkeye, we're seeing more and more bacteria that can resist mm -hmm. antibiotics. These drug-resistant bacteria kind of make your job a little harder, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. 
So what do we do? Um, we know like, I know meatpacking plants nationwide have been a source of outbreaks because oftentimes it's brought in by people who mm -hmm. have it and it's, it's just an environment where people are working closely together for a prolonged period of time. What do you do in that environment? Let's say you have an outbreak in a place like a meatpacking plant. What do you do to address that? One of you, let's take that well, off. Freeman. I'll first start out and say, you know, I would like to address one of Dr. Shoemaker's comments before that were, was so vitally important when he talked about the other organs and, and how TB can present, which is vitally important. I was talking to one of our, our burn and plastic surgeons, Dr. Bobsar, who's been on the show, and he said when he was training in India, because they do have a high prevalence of TB disease there, if tuberculosis was not on your differential for any patient that you were seeing that came into the hospital, you would automatically get an F. Now, a little bit of hyperbole, but to the fact of Dr. Shoemaker's point is it can affect any different organ in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, and so what are we doing to address and how that happens? I'll, I'll uh, kind of talk a little bit and then let Dr. Shoemaker get into the specifics. But I think this is how vitally important our public health infrastructure is and our public health workers. And we know that they, uh, uh, there has been just a high attrition rate of our public health workers because they are on the front lines every day doing those tuberculosis investigations as well as other disease processes, identifying contacts and then dealing with those contacts and understanding what do we need to do from here. Do we have to get treated for latent or TB infection? or do we need to get treated for TB disease, just as Dr. Shoemaker had commented on, and from there I'll just kind of let him talk. So an outbreak occurs in some place, I said meatpacking plant, it can be any, I don't yeah, know Yeah, I mean, it, it could is. be any congregant work setting. Yeah, a church setting, or what, what, what do you do? So we would first have to identify who has disease and needs to be isolated, because if they have disease, they're contagious, and then we would isolate them and get them started on treatment. Then we would have to identify all of the people that the person with disease was in contact with and evaluate them with tests for TB either, well you probably remember this, they probably did this to you when you were in school, not that I'm saying you're old. Yeah, I am old, yeah. and yes they did, it's But the old time, time they called ah, it the old time yes. test, right? Prick your skin. So the old react. skin test, or now we have a blood test which looks at how a particular subset of your white blood cells, the lymphocytes, work to see if you've been exposed to TB. And then we would do a chest x-ray and we would talk to the patient because these tests are good, but they're not perfect. So we would ask them about the symptoms that you listed. And then we would try to identify, do they have active disease or do they have latent disease? And if they have latent disease, we would treat them for that. And if they have active disease, then we would isolate them and treat them for that. When you say isolate, that means they can't, they should be isolated <clears throat> from their family members as much as possible. And then, because you have to do contact tracing. It's like the, the days of COVID. You gotta go all the way back. Right, and so if somebody has active disease, when we say isolate, we would recommend that they stay home. If they're in a house with other family, we would recommend they try to stay, just like with COVID, stay in your bedroom, stay away from, from people. If you have to go out to go to the restroom or to go to the kitchen, you know, put a mask on, try to stay away from other people. Don't go to work, don't go to the grocery store, don't go to church. Right, and if there's an outbreak in the chicken place or the, or the cattle, then the cattle have to go. I mean, we. You can get animal outbreaks, you can get human outbreaks. Yes. I mean, tuberculosis is a ubiquitous disease that can be everywhere. You gotta do the contact tracing, the isolation, and sometimes you may have to close a business or slow down until you get it figured out and under control. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's worst case scenario, right? And it, it's, it's a big darn deal. Yes. All right, now let's talk about another type of mycobacteria <laughs> that I thought was non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And Stu corrected me last night, along with Dr. Shoemaker and Dr. Hawkeye, that mycobacteria leprosy because there's, there's different types of mycobacteria, tuberculosis, leprosy is a type of that. Did I say that right? Sort of? Sort of. Not so really. Go ahead. Mycobacterium leprae, what causes leprosy, you know, I think most people uh, in the United States only know of leprosy from when they maybe were a kid and went to church and heard about, you know, Jesus mm -hmm. healing the lepers. But leprosy still happens, right? We yes. still see it, particularly within the tropical uh, regions of, of the world. There's still leprosy. Um, camps or whatever you get the right uh, places where people who have to gather. So with the lepers, United so States has a, a leprosy colony, so colony uh, in Baton Rouge, in and if if it's a really difficult case, we would send a patient down to Baton Rouge to the leprosy colony. Um, leprosy is interesting because it shares about half of its genetic material with TB, but it's not TB. But then it's not. Non -TB. non TB, right? So it's kind so of it's, it's the own. weird. It's the weird black sheep of the family. <laughs> yeah, so and. TB and the NTMs are predominantly pulmonary diseases. 
Leprosy is predominantly a skin disease and nerve disease. Um, and leprosy, unlike the other mycobacteria, we can't grow it, right? Uh, and although we think about it as being tropical, you know, it's, it's harbored by the nine-banded nine armadillo. Uh, so I dissuade all my high school buddies from finding the dead armadillo and propping it up and giving it a beer can and taking mm -hmm. a picture. Because mm -hmm. you don't have leprosy. Because you don't want to get leprosy, right? So, um, and as, as we've probably seen over the course of the last decade, you know, armadillos, because of changes with climate, armadillos are marching further and further north. Yes. They're all over southern Missouri now. All right, we're gonna switch gears. Um, we're gonna go to the non-TB, and we're gonna start talking about non-tuberculosis a little bit, and I wanna turn to Dr. Schmidt about this. Now, you are like this worldwide expert. You've done work for the CDC and for all sorts of international, you've been all over the world doing this, right? I mean, you, you, you've kind of, you're, you're sort of known this area. Well. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never say that about yourself. World renowned is a big, no, I, I did, I, I saw a lot of patients at NTM, let's put it that way. Okay, so <laughs> talk to us a little bit about what does it, why do we call it NTB, what does that mean? Well, as you said, the, di the diagnosis is, the definition is it's not TB, right, yeah, that's yeah. why, that's yeah. why, and the leprosy being in between there, so it's any of the, by now I think it's more than 200, and recognizing more and more different species. When you look at the guidelines 97, they had about 50 of those. I think 2007 they had 120, and the last one they talk about 190 in 2017, I think. So it's more and more detect because we use more genetic testing, and that way you find more of those which are out there. So I don't think we'll stop at 200. So there are a lot, I mean, Mycobacterium avium intracellulari, MAI, or whatever. We, we see our MAC, we see a lot of that. That was also right. very prevalent in HIV, both in the lung and in the gut. Right. Um, there's also lots of different kinds of mycobacterium. Uh, you and I in the cystic fibrosis program would see M. mycobacterium abscessus, maybe right. seeing M. mycobacterium chimera. All these are very hard, hard, hard bugs to treat. What makes them so hard to treat? Well, one, one part is that the diagnosis is, is a challenge because um, there is, in, in TB they have this um, latent and, and, and TB disease. The con there is no word for that in NTM, but it's kind of a similar thing. There are a lot of people who grow these bacteria mainly in their lung, like, again, like TB, you can grow them anywhere. Skin, bone, and if you are very immune suppressed, even in the bone marrow and in the blood. But um, they, are, they are often silent, and, and people have, can, can, patient can have them for 10, maybe even 20 years without anybody knowing. So that's part of the hard to, to treat. And then, as, as you said before, the, the, half, the, the, the turnover, the, the re, re growth rate is very slow. And they, they can hide in, in structures in the body. They can kind of be sleepy for, for decades, I would say. They have, they have, the metabolism allows them not to, not to grow, and with that, they are not accessible for the antibiotic treatment. And also, they have a very, very robust uh, surface, which is very hard to penetrate with antibiotics. And, Often they are encasing themselves in, in granulomas, which are hard to penetrate with, with antibiotics too. So well, granulomas are kind of the way the body walls stuff right, off a little bit. Right. So it'd be really difficult to treat, and it's a long course of therapy sometimes, right. especially if you're able to compromise. You may be on it for almost for life. Right. So it's, it's, it's hard to treat, right? And then there's this thing called hot tub lung. Right. Now, I don't know, for some reason, that has completely ruined the visualization for me of being, being in a hot tub. <laughs> hot tub lung. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, I mean, it comes with kind of two flavors. One is, uh, and, and that the second one may be not so well known, but, but if you, and I never, I never had a hot, I, I like of these jacuzzi type of things <laughs> anywhere close where I grew up, so I was kind of safe in that regard. But, but I, I, I understand that people don't really change the water of these, uh, of these hot, tubs. hot tubs very frequently. And hot water, or just water in general, is, is a perfect breeding ground for this uh, non-tuberculous mycobacterium, avium, one of those. And, and I, I worked in Florida for quite some time before, and so, so the, the Everglades are not really a big hot tub, but it's, had, it's a lot of water, and, and it's very humid, and, and they, they really, that's why, why NTM disease in areas like that is much more prevalent than here. Now, uh, the hot tub um, lung disease is one like, like we know, causing 
uh, inflammation, causing nodules in the lung, uh, typical lung disease. But, but the hot top lung disease uh, from NTM is also like a hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which you can have, and that's a little bit less known, which is a completely different treatment than for yes. the lung disease. And sometimes contrary, I mean, the two things kind of collide and run up against each other. So this is a difficult topic, though, because, you know, this NTM and tuberculosis love water. They love standing water. They right. love machines that have water right. and run with water. Right. How do we keep it? How do we keep things like that that we have to use? How do we keep it clean? How do we make sure the hot tub or our, our washing machine or a dishwasher or pipes or any kind of equipment doesn't have non-tuberculous mycobacteria in it? Well, it's very difficult. I mean, um, what, what at the end of the day, there is there's not much you can do. Uh, the one thing which, which is that keep the water temperature at a certain level. Uh, I think particularly the south there, they have the water at, at, uh, at 45 degrees Celsius, and I'm a Celsius guy, not a foreign You're going to have to translate that, but I think it's like, boy, it's not quite boiling temperature, but it's very hot. Uh, it's not quite boiling in a no, 45 no, degree no, no. Celsius. But, but, but if you go up to 60, so I watched that transform, you, you, you probably know it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's something It's 140 hot. maybe. Yeah, it's so, so then, then you have a better, pro because these, these uh, bacteria can, can make, uh, live in the tubing. And it doesn't help really to change the, the shower head because the problem just is behind, behind there, yeah. the whole tubing system. So, so, so that's what... But it's there, but, but you can. So it's something you have to be thoughtful about, and if people start getting sick, something your physician should always think about. Now, viewers might find it interesting. There's a mycobacterium named after the state of Kansas called, wait for it, Mycobacterium kansasii. First described here in, in the state of Kansas, 1952. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, what's different about M. kansasii? Well, M. kansasii is kind of probably want the closest NTM to, to tuberculosis. It kind of acts a little bit like that, which uh, is, is giving you, uh, can, tends to have cavitary disease. It's, it's like TB, it's actually fairly easy to treat compared to the outcomes are, are actually, uh, if, you need, if, you, if you look for an NTM, Maybe Kansasi would be the one to go for. Kansasi is one to have. You don't want to have. <laughs> you don't want to have some of these others like scrofulum or some other great right. names out there. It'll be hard, to, hard, 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 hard to treat. Okay, send any questions you might have into the chat uh, into the chat threads on Facebook, YouTube. You know all about us, the the, the Medical News Network, etc. Let's check in now with Doc Hawk and a quick. COVID update. Yeah. Nationally, wastewater viral te uh, testing remains uh, hot, very high. The newest CDC wastewater yeah. graph, though, shows the Midwest and Northeast regions ticking up a little bit while the West is dropping the South State flat. Talk to us. Where do you think we are? Yeah, you know, I'm hoping we are going down and decreasing as far as disease goes. That means people who are going to the emergency department, those people that are being hospitalized. We know that the data from August 24th, so it is lagging behind, did show a slight decrease in the total percentage of people who were presenting to the emergency department uh, for COVID-19 or respiratory illness. It's still at that 2.5%, but overall it is has fallen very slightly the last three weeks in a row. In addition, we know that the data from that week, August 24th, also showed overall a decrease in hospitalization rate uh, of 3.1. This is from the peak of about 4.6 a couple weeks prior. And then also most importantly, or also importantly is, is death. So we know that the deaths for that week was about 500 compared to about uh, 750 the week before. So hopefully we are getting to the end End of this current surge just as we get ready to go into respiratory viral season. We know there are vaccines to help prevent and decrease your risk of going to the hospital. It is vitally important. We know that here at the health system, our go lives for uh, influenza vaccine and the maternal RSV vaccine are happening in this week. And then right now, the uh, adult RSV vaccines and the COVID-19 updated vaccine, the go live is going to be some point in the future. We are hoping to take inventory of those vaccines fairly soon. And you can get them right now from CVS and Walgreens. Absolutely. And you can get yep. RSV. And just to say out loud, Novavax is out there. Yes. Um, so if you don't like a messenger RNA vaccine, you want a traditional vaccine for COVID, you can do the Novavax vaccine because that's what that is. Last year, uptake was only around 
down 20 percent a lot of room for improvement now i had COVID back in, uh, in Ju early june after international international travel and and um i am so i'm going to wait you know, at least 90 days so i'll probably i'm probably looking october november for my shot probably october hawkeye how about you yeah for sure um is because we are getting out of the surge right now um so i'm i'm thinking later as well now also my children have had uh COVID recently so i'm going to wait probably three months until after their acute infection but i will be vaccinating them because we know that vaccination can help reduce harm if you are vaccinated uh, and then you are infected or you do have COVID-19, especially reduction in the rate of long COVID. And we don't want anybody to get that adult or child. Um, so we know that the vaccine can help reduce that risk as well. All right, we have a rare treat today. Thanks, Hawkeye. We have a rare treat today. Stuart Downing Vest, the guy who's kind of the showrunner, puts his program yeah. together. He's actually in the control room today, monitoring questions from our community. Stu, how are you? Don't bubble up this job. <laughs> no fumbles. Uh, I'm doing well. Cheese fry, red fry, red, red, red Wednesday. No bumbles. No fumbles. All right. So uh, I want to follow up on a question we actually got last week from Joellen McGranaham. You might have remembered she asked that she had remembered something about um, the COVID vaccine maybe interfering with mammograms. And we didn't really have a good answer, but I did follow up oh, I with uh, this story. Dr. I, it does not. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. It can cause some lymph node swelling that can be reflect, mm -hmm. look like lymphadenopathy and uh, on a mammogram. And so, uh, Hawk, talk to us a little bit about that. It, it, because there, there's a, uh, I believe, if I remember things correctly, a suggested waiting period after a COVID vaccine before you have your mammogram. Yeah, it, it is transient. And again, that was when the uh, vaccine was first rolled out. It's hard to tell, you know, as we get uh, through time and people have had multiple vaccine doses or infection or reinfection, does that still occur? Just as we know, over time, long COVID rates have decreased uh, over time since the vaccine first roll out. Uh, rolled out, we know that there was initially that time where you would have the lymphadenopathy, just as you talked about, could affect the mammogram but it was transient and they did just recommend a, a short waiting period, so. Awesome, got a question here from Jeremy Yenser who wrote, are things like tuberculosis or leprosy going to be beatable or are they just manageable and something we try to prevent from spreading? Ooh, great question, Dr. Schmaker. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess when we talk about beatable, the it would be, let's break it up into two things, right? Can we beat it when during there's a, an outbreak? Yes, we can, we can treat individual patients and we can defeat outbreaks. Now beatable in the context of like we eradicated polio, that's a, a heavier lift, right? Because this bacteria has been around for hundreds of millions of years, well, right? It's so ubiquitous in water And, and it's everywhere. You're just, you're so, not, you're just not gonna get rid of it. Um, I just don't think you would able, no. be able to get rid of it. No, I, don't think, I think that's right. And I think the bigger concern is when you get multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, and we know that that exists, that therapy is hard because sometimes people die despite the best of our efforts because we don't have a drug that may treat that bacteria. Right, right. Got a uh, somewhat off topic question. So get ready for this curveball from Yin Liang who says, um, First, starts with a statement. Sweating through exercise promotes blood circulation, which can help boost our immune system. So that's what he's positing. And he wants to ask if sweating through hot spring baths or a sauna or through foot soaks can also help people with physical disabilities promote blood circulation and enhance their immune system as well. So any thoughts? You know, okay, you're an exercise guy, <laughs> kind of like me. I love exercise for patients right. and to tell them about that. And from lung disease, we always promote exercise. Right, and, and I, think, I think exercise, I didn't say before, but this is talking, treating NTM is not just giving antibiotics, it comes with exercise, nutrition, and, and a lot of different things which are as important like that. Now, um, I'm, I mean, sauna is a good thing, I would say. They, they really like it in, in the no northern part of, 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 the, of, of the globe, if you want, probably in a very southern one too, but I'm more familiar with the northern one. But I, I, I would, if I would say if, if the patient feels like it's doing it's good for them, I would do it. I'm not aware of any 
I, I would prefer sweating on the treadmill or, or running outside than, than in the sauna if you look for a, a real benefit in, in health. That I think the key is you want to improve the cardiovascular health. Right. To do that, you got to exercise, not just right. sit in the sauna and do that. And right. I'd be a little careful about the sauna just so right. you don't get further inoculation or infection with another tuberculosis or another type, type of mycobacteria while you're in there if you're already sick with mycobacteria. So in general, though, uh, exercise clearly improves health and does, uh, we know p patients who exercise have have longer life expectancies, recover faster, do better in surgeries. I mean, there's no question about the overall health benefits. Quick comment from Ruth Ellen, who wrote that she is getting our COVID vaccine today with a thumbs up emoji. So way to go, awesome. Ruth Ellen. And then a question from Amy here, who said that she heard mm -hmm. some TB treatments can change the color of your skin. And she wants mm -hmm. to know what color mm -hmm. does your skin change to and why does that happen? Okay. So I, I'm not familiar. There are some antibiotics that can change the color of your skin. The TB drugs that we commonly use do not change the color of your skin, but what they do change is the color of your secretions. So your tears, your urine will turn an orange or a red color when you're on rifampin or one of its cousins. Um, it's a benign process, and as soon as you stop taking the drug, your urine will go back to its natural golden color, and you'll be... Uh, back to normal. But one of the caveats we always tell patients is if you're going to be on rifampin and you wear soft contact lenses, know that it will be stained kind of orange, which could be cool. I mean, I don't know. An orange eyes. It would yeah. go with that bow tie you yeah. have on today. Yeah. Yeah, I'm all about that. All right. Just quickly. Uh, Please. It's, it's not, it's not uh, I mean, it's not like a first line TB drug, but what the what the, 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 the listener may refer to is clofazimine, which is uh, which we use for TB as well as non-TB, and, and once you, you get into, into the multidrug resistant problem yeah. with TB, it's an excellent drug for TB as well for anti-TB. Also excellent because, as I mentioned before, some of these mycobacteria, they tend to be sleepy, and, and clofazimine is one of the few drugs who also kills kind of the ones who are not metabolizing much. So. Yeah, I mean, and that gives you back to the question of the skin. It right, you, right. No, I mean, really I guess. like a healthy sun, yeah, lying on the beach type of, of color of the skin. Mm -hmm. And I guess to add to that, some of the, the NTMs we treat with an, an old time tetracycline called menocycline, and it can cause a bluish discoloration in your skin in some patients. Which also goes away. Most, Most of, the of the time, it will yeah. get better after you stop the drug, yes. All right, this has been a great discussion. I want to get final thoughts from our guests this morning. Doc Hawk, I'm going to start with you. You know, yeah, I think this this was a great discussion. Uh, kind of just parsing out mycobacteria in general and the difference between the two major types, TB and the other ones. Uh, so I think it is very helpful for people to understand that, especially in light of the KDHE uh, press release that occurred a, a, a couple of weeks ago and what Dr. Shoemaker was discussing. So I think it just continues to be important to endorse the importance of our public health infrastructure and those public health workers because they are out there on the front lines every day trying to keep our whole community safe uh, because we are all in this together. Dr. Cock. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dr. Shoemaker. I mean, I'm going to, since it's... You guys are all the same. Since it's know. Chiefs Wednesday, I'm going to call an audible and go non-mycobacteria in general and just encourage everybody to get their influenza, COVID, and RSV vaccines. I love it. Always a good plan. Dr. Schmidt. Yeah, I, uh, I I think really that that was just from the anti-B anti anti perspective that people, when they are out there and feeling uh, sick with respiratory symptoms may, may think about that and may even ask their physician to check for it if they, uh, because it's not really on top of the, of the list for many, for many people. I just want to pick up on a thread that Doc Hawk mentioned about public health workers. You know, our family medicine department's done a great job in this spectrum for a long time, Wyandotte County, Johnson County, across the state, as well as our infectious disease team, et cetera. You know, all the folks who work in public health every day can get exposed to stuff that they don't know when they're walking into. And uh, they are heroes of health care, just as we're going to see some heroes at Arrowhead on Thursday night. I think they're going to be wearing red and not purple. That's my prediction. I want to say thanks to everyone for watching and listening. Remember, faith, hope, and science together. Tuberculosis, we can beat it. Let's do this. We'll talk to you soon. A nickname that comes with a medical story made for a movie. I'm Alexis Del Cid on the next All Things Heart. Find out why his friends call him Miracle. 
Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stein's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.